Welcome to Aleph, Traditional Wisdom in Review. Aleph is a digital media collective dedicated to publishing philosophically engaged content which brings together perspectives from both classical Islamic sources and the Western intellectual tradition. Our hope is to go beyond a model of mere dialogue and develop an approach focused on synthesis, the discovery of new relations, and the creation of points of integration. This podcast is part of a series where we interview the authors of the articles we publish to take a deeper dive into some of the information and topics they explored in their writing. Today, I'm joined by Esme Partridge to discuss her article, Beyond Enlightenment Rationality, Islamic Epistemologies. In this article, Esme takes aim at the Enlightenment traditions of rationality and empiricism, saying that these philosophies leave something to be desired, as they can often lead to narrow conceptions of truth and objectivity. Esme contrasts these Western traditions with Islamic epistemologies. Esme contends that Islamic thinkers such as Ibn Sina, Al-Farabi, and Al-Ghazali offer more robust conceptions of truth which allow one to grapple with dimensions of life beyond the purely material and empirical. Esme is a recent graduate from SOAS University of London with a BA in religion, where she focused on Islamic studies. Esme is a prolific writer whose works have appeared in numerous publications such as Renovatio, the Journal of Zaytuna College, Traversing Tradition, the Royal Society of Arts, and of course, Aleph. Now, on to our conversation. Hi, Esme. Thanks for coming to talk about your article today. Hi, nice to be talking to you as usual. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So your article is titled Beyond Enlightenment Rationality, Islamic Epistemologies. Uh, and so with Aleph, we try and bring together things from the Islamic tradition and from Western intellectual traditions. So this piece, of course, is dealing with uh, epistemology and uh, sort of pitting Islamic ideas and uh, Enlightenment ideas against each other. A little more polemic than uh, than we perhaps usually do, but this piece resonated with a lot of people. So there's definitely something to it. My first question for you, Esme, is what what was your motivation for uh, putting these against one another? Why did you take aim at this Enlightenment tradition? So right now we're very much in a time where we're challenging a lot of axiomatic assumptions. I think 2020 was perhaps the most definitive year in that sense. It was completely taking down all of the hegemonies that were in place. And regardless of how you feel about that, there are still quite a lot of hegemonies which I think need addressing. And I think the biggest one, which nobody seems to be talking about really, to at least a an intellectually developed degree is the hegemony of enlightenment rationality. Because in pretty much every aspect of life, be that science, be that politics, even academic philosophy, which is something I've written about previously for the Royal Society of Arts, there is this sense of epistemic supremacy, which is based in the enlightenment, which is based on the notion that we can see, or rather in rational means derived from sense perception, we can obtain truth. And the problem is, as an extension of that, there does end up being a rejection of truths that go beyond those empirical modes. So I just wanted to dig into this and to actually look at Enlightenment rationality and to really critique it in light of a religious perspective and to fuse that with my theological background, I suppose, um, in the hopes of I suppose exposing in a way the this this any in many ways unsaid hegemony. Right. Yeah. That uh, that helps outline your project certainly. So, uh, what what are the the issues beyond the the fact that these things are hegemonic, as you say? What does rationality and empiricism uh, get wrong, or or what does it miss? Well, I think firstly, there's an inherent issue in the fact that it's often treated to be the most objective, um, and this is just a fallacy because it comes from a very particularistic milieu, right? It comes from something which is Eurocentric if you're inclined to to use that kind of language, but I actually prefer, and I think it's much more accurate to use the term chronocentric, as in it treats one particular period of time, namely modernity, although albeit that is quite a fluid conception, as I believe Louis Louis Dupre pointed out, modernity is fluid and how we define modernity is a complex thing. So I don't want to 
I don't want to just lump in one one definition of modernity when it is quite complex. However, at the end of the day, that Enlightenment modernity does assume this prized position, which is inevitably chronocentric. So it's it's just simply wrong to treat it as being objectively to, to treat it as being objective, to treat it as being the measure of, of all things. But coming at things from a theological perspective, and not just a reactionary one, because I acknowledge that to some degree this is quite a postmodern project, and that's something which I would like to actually discuss later, because I suppose you could say that by attacking chronocentrism, I am attacking a certain conception of modernity, and doesn't that make me a fervent postmodernist? I hope not, um, <laughs> but we can talk about that later, I suppose. Um, but the reason that I mainly have a criticism of it is not just for its own sake, as I say, it's not just to be reactionary, it's because I think it's fundamentally only providing a very small and limited impression of what knowledge is. And I think with the hegemony of this type of rationality, it's quite violently exiling perspectives which don't conform to that empirical model. And as a result, you see the ridiculing of religious beliefs. You see the, the frankly complete undermining of people who want to espouse a theological truth claim, who even want to do something so radical as, as dare that there are elements of, of this universe that are unseen, or in, as the Quran puts it, the al ghaib the unseen. And I'm sure we'll come to this later, but this is a really integral part of Islam. So coming to this discussion and this, this discourse from a, a, a broadly conceived Islamic lens, I think it's really important to, to scrutinize what the limits are of only seeing, seeing the world in this very limited way, which we consider to be objective, even though it really isn't, as I say, it's very chronocentric. Yeah, certainly. So just to narrow in a bit, uh, you're, you're dealing with two philosophical ideas here, uh, empiricism and rationality. So for our listeners who are perhaps less familiar with, with these terms, empiricism is basically the idea that all knowledge can be derived through the senses. So you get perceptions uh, coming into your senses, and then from there you are able to get true information about uh, the world and experience. And uh, rationality especially is, is grounded in these enlightenment traditions as well. People often go back to Descartes with his idea of the cogito, uh, I think, therefore I am, is his famous phrase. So basically grounding an idea of, of knowledge and uh, the functioning of, the, of, a, of a mind within an individual and having that as, as a basis for all sorts of uh, cognition and, and philosophical Ventures. So these are separate traditions, but uh, they converge in, in certain ways, uh, especially in terms of this hegemonic aspect that you, you mentioned earlier. So I, I'm guessing a, a staunch empiricist would, would shoot back, or maybe, maybe someone would just uh, sort of naturally come upon this kind of critique. But, uh, oh, you say that uh, empiricism is not objective. What could be more objective than seeing something with your own eyes? What's, what's your response to, to that uh, challenge? So I'm just going to go straight in to one of Al-Ghazali's own responses to this common claim, um, which he delineates quite wonderfully with the example of a star. And he explains how when you're looking at a star from, from a distance, it appears to only be the size of a, of a dinner, of a coin. And of course, it appears to be that small from where you're standing from your empirical perception. But of course, it's actually vastly bigger than that. And although this seems like a very simplistic example, I think it very succinctly responds to this criticism that what we see with our eyes is clearly true. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a, a fascinating example from from one of these Islamic thinkers. If I could push a little further, uh, I think the empiricist would say, well, certainly the, the senses don't provide sufficient knowledge without the background of uh, scientific uh, discovery. And that too is, is, is empirical. So you can use scientific measurements to calculate the distance of the star. And then with that distance, you are able to, to calculate the size based on how it appears at a, at a certain distance. So you're, you're able to, to get to, to the correct knowledge of, of the size of this object. What do you think uh, is, is the issue with that? So I think that you're right. Um, and I think that those procedures, which are still ultimately derived from empiricism, but qualified by calculation and rationality in, in some sense of the term, 
But ultimately, through those kinds of methods, you're only ever going to be able to grasp a physical understanding of the star. And that's fine for certain purposes. If you're an astronomer and you merely want to understand what is the, the physical ontology of a star, then, then fine. This kind of epistemology is, is necessary and it's suited to that purpose. But something that's really foundational to the argument that I and the Islamic thinkers I'm drawing on are trying to make here is that there are different dimensions of knowledge pertaining to different qualities of being, to different ontological states. And this is something which Al-Kindi makes very clear in his treatise on first philosophy, where he says that one ought not to seek demonstrative perception. So let's, let's use that as a substitute for empiricism right now. One ought not to seek empirical perception when trying to grasp just any object of study, for not every object of study is deceived through empirical demonstration, because not everything has an empirical demonstration, only some things have this empirical dimension. I'm sort of paraphrasing, paraphrasing there, and I hope I'm not wrongly projecting terms onto, onto him, but I think being quite familiar with Al-Kindi, I think what he's basically saying here is that empiricism has its purpose, but that by no means can offer you the full picture. And I think this is what Al-Ghazali is trying to say, is that ultimately the senses are deceptive, not necessarily just in the case of a star, but they're deceptive in making us think that there only there is only one dimension to things and that things are truly as they appear to the body. And the body, of course, is, is corporeal. The body is on a completely different ontological wavelength, as it were, to conceptual truths beyond that subject. And this, of course, is so deeply entrenched in the Quranic worldview, namely in the distinction between the world of the seen and the world of the unseen, the alam al ghaib And this appears in Surah al-Baqarah, it's, it's mentioned, you know, believers are those who believe in the unseen. That's such a crucial dimension of faith. And it's also a crucial dimension of, of existing, not just, not just believing, in, believing in God, but it's something we see all around us. There is more to life than physical perception, and there are different modes of perception for different, different phenomena. And of course, not from the Islamic tradition and not even overtly from, from a religious tradition. You have a number of thinkers who are trying to trying to challenge this view that everything is reduced to just pure physicality and corporeal sense organs. I mean, notably, um, Rupert Sheldrake has done some incredibly fascinating, brilliant work in this in this field, trying to, to some extent, deconstruct the, the scientific assumptions of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment worldview. We can, we can talk more about, about his work if you'd like. I think you're you're a fan too, as am I. Yeah, Sheldrake has has uh, definitely put out some fascinating stuff within a, a scientific. Well, he's he's a unique figure uh, within a scientific establishment, yet drawing on a very different kind of understanding of how how to how to do science and what what could be what science could be and what mm -hmm. uh, could be a way to do science. But uh, perhaps before we, we head down, down that path, I'd love to, to discuss this idea of the intellect, which is, is so central to, to these Islamic thinkers that you're citing and, and to the argument you're making here. So I could see someone uh, reading this piece and uh, not being so familiar with some of these specific philosophical terms and saying, oh, uh, rationality, the intellect, that sounds like the, the same sort of thing to me. So mm -hmm. could you unpack what what intellect means specifically in this theological context of the Islamic uh, tradition and how that differs from what rationality has come to mean in this uh, Enlightenment heritage. Sure. So I think it's really important to begin with the notion that there are different degrees of intellect. And this goes back, I suppose, to what we were just talking about. There are certain modes of intellection which are necessary for certain pursuits of discovery. And there are certain pursuits where a completely different mode of intellect needs to be activated. Uh, now, of course, this is articulated within Christian theology, particularly in Thomas Aquinas, and his notion of rationality in the form of the ratio is, of course, very theologically imbued. Um, for Aquinas, of course, you know, the ratio, rationality, it isn't just the brain's abilities to compute data and come to come to quantitative conclu conclusions. The ratio is actually an inheritance from, from the divine. It's the divine ability to to rationalize, um, and that is part of the Imago Dei. So of course, in the Christian tradition, there is definitely there are definitely notions of rationality and intellection having theological, spiritual, once again, use that term tentatively, di dimensions. But personally, I think it's best articulated in the Islamic tradition, 
something which is, I suppose, really uh, was always really caught my attention about Islamic theology and philosophy is this concept of the active intellect. So the active intellect is basically, I'm not sure if I don't want to ontologize it as being a realm as such, it can be expressed in that way as a kind of a realm, a sort of space beyond, beyond the material plane, but it's a very conceptual entity in that it's the notion of such thing as an intellect which can grasp immaterial truths. So while you have a degree of intellect which can grasp material reality, there is a higher, more elevated station which can grasp immaterial reality, going back to that unseen world. And this realm is very closely interlinked with the imagination. And the imaginal realm, uh, as we've seen articulated in Ibn Arabi and also Henry Corbin, of course, who you've worked on yourself, the imagination is, because it's ontologically higher than the creative world, because it exists in the mind, it's closer to a sort of platonic form type, type realm. It can perceive things in their perfect states. It can understand images. It can see their meanings. Um, and this notion of meaning as something which is extrasensory, there are these, these truths which the imagination can access, albeit representing through often symbolism of, of the material world, but that's a, another, another conversation, I suppose. But this notion of meaning is something which um, Ibn Sina actually touches on. For him, the active intellect is a place where there are ma'ana, which is the Arabic word for, for meaning, um, which is very similar in a lot of ways to the concept of Platonic form. It's these things which are objectively representative of certain truths. And it's through the active intellect that we can come to those truths. Now, the active intellect, you don't arrive at the active intellect through studying the material world, although, of course, I suppose some some observations could elevate you um, up above the material plane. For example, beauty, seeing representations of beauty can elevate the mind, which is why art and the experience of absorbing art and I guess to some extent music and other art forms is a spiritual experience because it lifts you up to the realm of, of platonic forms, the realm of, of perfection and ontological simplicity. So anyway, <laughs> that was a bit of a digression, but to answer your original question in a roundabout way, there are different gradations of intellect. And the one that I'm talking about here is not so much that one which is purely operating on the material plane, to use slightly new agey language, um, but rather it's going beyond that and it's going straight to these platonic forms and ultimately the truth, al-haq, as in God and the existence of God. So my question then is, what is the reason you'd say that the active intellect of these Islamic philosophers provides a superior means for obtaining objectivity, objective truth than these enlightenment epistemologies? Sure. So I think without becoming too political, I think we are really seeing the consequences of what happens when you lose the binding, you lose the aspiration towards beauty, you lose the aspiration towards community and things which I would argue are quite objectively good things. And actually Al-Farabi says something really telling about this, which is that when societies turn away from objective truth, or rather when they deny it and they seek happiness in other things, things which are lower metaphysically than, than those truths contained within the active intellect, so that being bodily desires and animalistic urges, Al-Farabi says that when societies turn towards that kind of gratification and that kind of those kinds of ideals, their senses become distorted and they start to perceive ugly things as being beautiful and beautiful things as being ugly. And he analogizes this with the notion of medicine. When you're ill, medicine tastes horrible. It tastes, tastes bitter. Um, and in the same way that if you're, if you're ill, you might taste something which you used to really enjoy eating, but that tastes, that tastes sour, um, which is funny because I've heard people having this when they've had COVID. Um, and I think I was, I was saying this to someone else as well. It's really, it's really funny like how, how telling this is. So Al-Farabi is uh, definitely being proven right. His, his analogy is very pertinent right now. Um, and for Al-Farabi, this confusion that we're, we're experiencing, where people are perceiving beautiful things and as ugly and vice versa, it is a clear indication of spiritual sickness, that being when people have turned away from objectivity and they've turned away from notions of beauty and they instead 
come to the conclusion that no, there is there is no such thing as beauty, or if there is, it's purely what what I what my personal tastes are. And I think there's definitely some room for personal tastes in all of this. But I think what Al Farabi is saying is so relevant today um, because we are seeing at a cultural level. I I believe the perception of bitter things as sweet and the perception of sweet things as bitter. And if we are to follow Al Farabi's diagnosis of this. That is because there has been this diversion away from higher principles and the active intellect. And we're resorting to, to phenomena of the lower world and to perceptions of the lower world. So I think epistemology, although it might sound like a very specific branch of philosophy, it's actually, you know, it's so foundational for, for what truths we open ourselves up to, uh, or rather which, which truths we choose to ignore. And those, th- those don't just cause problems within philosophical discourse, but those actually cause problems in society. I mean, this is why Plato said that we need to have a philosopher king and to perhaps maybe slightly misproject Al-Farabi's Islamic Neoplatonism onto, onto Plato's own political theory. I think the role of a kind of philosopher king, as broadly conceived as, as you'd like it to be, is to attune societies with those higher values and with, with those active, those figments of, of the active intellect. So I think I think it's important because it does affect things at a social political level. That's me. This conversation has been wonderful. So I have one one last question before we we close out here. Uh, so earlier you mentioned that your project here could be considered almost uh, as a postmodern uh, critique, and then earlier also we mentioned Rupert Sheldrake in a in a positive light. So it, it appears that there are strands of Western thought that are more consonant uh, with with what you see these Islamic thinkers as doing or or providing. So could you speak a little bit about where you might see these things line up and where in the Western tradition uh, there's there's also uh, something more positive than than this uh, hubris of these Enlightenment epistemologies, as you put it? So I think something which I do mention in the article itself is that the, the European Romantic tradition, I suppose, was the most immediate pushback, I suppose, against the hegemony of Enlightenment thought. You have, of course, William Blake and other Romantic figures who were really trying to revive a sense of the sacred, even if they weren't necessarily doing that in a kind of systematic, overtly theological way. And you know, in the present time, of course, you do have have a number of scholars working working on this. I suppose deconstructing the Enlightenment hegemony, most notably Rupert Sheldrake, who I really admire because, as I think you mentioned earlier, he is really doing this from a very interdisciplinary perspective, and he is looking at real world science. Um, I think the, the the main way that I suppose Sheldrake's work departs from the Islamic tradition, or, or what what we're trying to get from from the Islamic philosophical tradition, is that. What's quite interesting about about Sheldrake's conclusions is that he actually often finds the opposite of objectivity through his through his investigations into non empirical science, um, and this is something which I've still been trying to kind of grapple with because it does admittedly throw a bit of a spoke in the wheel for my for my arguments that you know non empirical uh, epistemology is, is is an opening to to objectivity and fixed laws. Um, I mean, for example, it's a, a bit in the, in the science delusion where he does this really interesting case study of a type of chemical which is used in the production of chewing gum. And they found that th- this chemical, it randomly changed structure for no apparent reason. It just morphed into something else over the course of, I can't remember, but it was a, it was a almost seemed to defy the laws of physics because it just morphed into something else. And the, the chewing gum manufacturer was like, what on earth <laughs> was going on? Um, and... I mean, he, he gives many examples in, in his book, and it's, it's, I don't think it's his conclusion to say, oh, there are there are no laws, everything's just you know chaos. Um, but I think what it does what it does highlight highlight uh, what it does point out. Um, while I don't think that that contradicts what I'm what, what I'm trying to argue here and what the Islamic thinkers are arguing here, because they they might they actually might say that the um, sporadic and strange kind of entropy of, of the of the physical world could just be another expression of contingency so it's still kind of stuck in the realm of, of the of the dunya of the physical world I suppose that's one argument um, but I think what we should maybe take from that is that there's not a direct correlation between non non-empirical epistemology and objective truth there is still there's a lot to probe here it's not just a matter of like go beyond the senses and everything will be clear and ordered um, there are quite a lot of layers i think of of contingency that we have to get through um, but ultimately you know when you when you're accessing the 
the active intellect, you're totally going beyond the level of scientific experimentation, which is mostly what Rupert Sheldrake is, is, con is concerned with. So I think I'll conclude by saying that there are many, many positive contributions being made to this field. And I think it would be excellent if science and also to some extent, the, the medical world actually could start to, to accommodate these, these notions. Perhaps that's a conversation for another for another time. But I think what is really, really important, I think, at the end of the day, is allowing these perspectives, these more theologically informed perspectives, which do acknowledge that there is something beyond the physical world. I think we need to allow them entry back into academic discourse, because at the moment there is this, as I say before, there is this hegemony where these ideas are simply they are actually laughed at actually most most of the time there is this this sense of you know these things these things these things are backward or regressive and of course there is really nothing more chronocentric than than calling something regressive or, or you know just just because it doesn't conform to what is considered to be objective in a particular place and time so i think if we could really reignite this dialogue where we have an understanding that faith perspectives and scientific perspectives, yes, they're doing different things because Al as Al-Kindi says, they are seeking different modes of modes of perception for different phenomena. But that doesn't mean that they can't work together in a more holistic worldview. And I think that's what we really should be striving towards. Well, Esme, thank you for coming on today and, and sharing your thought that you uh, researched for your article and uh, also uh, taking us down some other very interesting uh, discussions here. So if you haven't read Esme's article, it is titled Beyond Enlightenment Rationality, Islamic Epistemologies. And you can get to that on our Medium page, which is read.elifreview.com. Thank you, Esme. Take care. Thank you. This has been a conversation on Islamic epistemologies with Esme Partridge. As always, links to our pieces can be found in the show notes. This podcast is produced by Aleph, Traditional Wisdom in Review. Thank you for listening.